Hello, and welcome to The Psychonaut Show with Dr. J.K.B. This is John K. Burton, M.D., psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. And on this podcast, your captain on these voyages to explore strange new worlds in inner space. Our mission is to uncover knowledge that will ultimately make us more effective, more connected, and more attractive in our daily lives. In this episode, we are going to explore the second testament of the Psychonaut, the testament of active curiosity. And I don't know about you, but when I think of the word curiosity, I think of Curious George. I had a friend in college and he made fun of me every time I would say something like, I'm curious about that. He would always reply, George was curious. And of course he was referring to the story of Curious George. And so as I was uh, preparing for this episode, I decided I was going to go and find out about Curious George again. I hadn't read him, obviously, for a very long time. And so I went to Barnes & Noble to find uh, Curious George, and some people might not like Barnes & Noble. It's an awfully big corporation, and it's criticized for selling a lot of things that aren't books. But it does sell books, and it sells lots of books, and and that's a, a good thing. And usually, especially with a children's book, you can you can find it there. So I did, I went there and I found the complete collected stories of Curious George. And I read that that line that my friend said was actually incorrect. The correct line in each story begins, this is George, he was a good little monkey and he was very curious. Sometimes the story says, but he was very curious as if being good and curious are opposite of each other. And we'll see that curiosity can be kind of a dangerous thing. But in each story, George always gets into some kind of trouble because of his curiosity. But in each story, he grows from his adventures and he meets new people and he visits new places and learns new things, all with the help of the man with the yellow hat whom he lives with. And you kind of think, I kind of think, if only the world were always so friendly to curiosity. And my my friend from college admitted to me one time that he had had this uh, odd childhood semi-erotic fascination with the man with the yellow hat that Curious George lived with, such as the nuances of our inner worlds. And I will tell you, as I read the, the complete stories of Curious George, I learned that the man with the yellow hat was not so innocent. And the origin story, the origin story, if you will, of Curious George is that the man with the yellow hat actually kidnaps Curious George from his home, from his idyllic African jungle, stuffs him in a bag, puts him on a boat and rows him out to sea. And George is sad. We see him looking back at his home. It's quite heartbreaking, actually, if you think of it. And we never hear about this again. But you see, this is where my curiosity got me. It got me to something that I didn't know before that enriched my understanding of the story, maybe not in the nicest way. Uh, The man with the yellow hat is not such a beneficent figure after all, but um, it definitely led me to learn something I didn't know before, something to think about. At any rate, the testament of active curiosity that I went over in the six testaments, but this episode we're going to get into this particular one, The Testament of Active Curiosity says this, We will be curious about any action, pattern, or phenomenon that we are confronted with, no matter whether it be painful, pleasurable, or seemingly obvious. And in the case of Curious George, it's sort of painful to find out that the man with the yellow hat was not such a good guy. But if I follow the Testament of Active Curiosity further, and maybe if the authors were alive, we could talk to them and we could learn about the man with the yellow hat and maybe his backstory and and all of that. So we would always get somewhere just like Curious George does. The Testament of Active Curiosity goes along with the First Testament, the Testament of Neutrality, as the two Testaments of Action because they are essential to one another. First, as we explore our inner worlds, we are non-judgmental, but then 
we need to be curious. And we can be curious because we are non-judgmental. Now, let me give you an example where the testament of active curiosity made a difference in something that a person that I knew was trying to achieve. But before I get into that story, let me say a word about active curiosity. When I thought about the word curiosity, it seemed like it should be all I needed to describe this testament. Each testament was one word, and I like symmetry, and I wondered why do I keep feeling like it has to be active curiosity? Isn't curiosity active by definition? Isn't that redundant? But there was something about this that kept telling me, no, the word active is important. And I really thought about it. And I decided to leave it in because active says it's not just this sort of vague interest about things that may pass in front of us. Like, oh, isn't that curious? But it's about going after something because we want to understand. We're active explorers going deeper than the surface layers. So let me tell you about an example that concerns an actual person where the testament of active curiosity actually was central in overcoming and and making something of a particular challenge. So since I live and work in New York City, which is the financial capital of the world, at least for now, uh, I have the opportunity to meet and talk with a number of people in the business world and the financial world that I would never get to know otherwise. And this particular example concerns someone who was a, who was and is a venture capitalist. Now that might sound like a dirty word to my friends who are Bernie Sanders supporters, but let me just explain that uh, what venture capitalists do is they raise money and they invest in businesses so that businesses can get started and grow and you know enrich our experiences hopefully some businesses may be providing things that we really don't need and kind of cluttering up the planet if you will but other ones hopefully are in need of capital and need this investment to get going and actually provide something useful to our economy and to our community anyway that's enough of that kind of little philosophical tangent. Um, I feel grateful that I have been able to meet these people that I that I wouldn't otherwise meet and find them very creative and intelligent and, and uh, thoughtful. So this particular person was uh, raising a fund and the fund was to invest in businesses, in particular kinds of businesses that had an innovative kind of edgy approach to a particular corner of the market. And this person, this woman, had uh, been able to raise some money, but she was still in the fundraising phase, which if you know anything about fundraising in the investment world, it can be pretty harrowing. So in this fund, they had a limit, as is very common on uh, a minimum limit on how much an investor could put into the fund. And since this is high-end stuff, the limit was a half a million dollars that an investor had to put in in order to uh, be in the fund. And uh, what happened was one of the investors came along and said, well, they would give $250,000 into the fund. Now, obviously, that is half of what the limit was. But this uh, person, the, the, the person who had f- founded the fund, this woman, you know, she said, uh, well, that's less than our limit. But she went right ahead and said, well, we'll go ahead and accept it. And she didn't really say why. She knew that she had a feeling of um, frustration and a little confusion, but she didn't pursue it any further with the investor and didn't even really think about it too much herself. And when we talked about it a little bit further and she reflected on it, she said that she wanted to accept it because the investor was an important contact, was well known in the field, and she was worried about being offensive. She didn't ask why are you only giving me a half of what we have said our minimum is because she had her own worries she was worried the investor would say she wasn't worth it the fund was no good or whatever anyway even just kind of being curious about her own lack of curiosity if you will 
allowed her to kind of reestablish her own sense of value. Just think about this situation and even just consider asking, why are you not giving me the full amount? This kind of relates to the episode on the transitional space, that it wasn't, you know, just in her imagination that had previously been kind of not paid attention to, but it wasn't reality either. We could just say, well, why not the full amount? And when she thought about that, she was worried that uh, it would be offensive, that she would get an answer that I don't want to give you half a million dollars and she would feel rejected. But when we thought about it, we just realized there's really no downside to asking why not, as long as that's what you want to know. And the upside, even if you get a rejection, even if you hear something that you're afraid of, if you actually ask why is it this way, you will actually have information that will help you at the very least. And sometimes, many times when you ask, they will say something uh, that you hadn't thought of, or they will say, let me go ahead and give you what you are asking for. So we can see how the testament of active curiosity was very central in understanding this problem that this woman faced, this uh, founder of this fund in, in dealing with her investors. And what actually happened is that she did go back and ask him, and he hadn't really had a good reason. And when he was reminded that this was the minimum, he thought about it and said, I should invest with what's in line with the way the fund is being run. And she was pleasantly surprised that he was not offended and, and was actually interested in engaging in a conversation about that. And the thing is, is that curiosity is a testament. Active curiosity is a testament because it is so basic. If it's not there, we have to ask what is getting in the way. In the case of this woman and her fund, her worry about rejection, her worry about being offensive was getting in the way. Now, I was talking about this with another woman, a young woman who's working in the New York City public school system, and she's learning a lot about identity in adolescence, about different ethnic identities, about identities of sexual orientation, about gender identity. And she expressed a concern to me that being curious could be offensive, especially to a young person who's trying to establish their identity, and it might feel uh, off-putting, like it, it makes them self-conscious. And we really talked about it and, and we played out a few different examples and she realized that curiosity is really important. It's a basic, uh, as I said, a testament. But she helped me to clarify that it is very important to be clear about one's intent, that curiosity can't be used sarcastically, it can't be used offensively, like why are you doing that? It's about the intention, genuine curiosity. When curiosity is expressed genuinely, it's not offensive, it's engaging. We create a conversation. Now, the caveat is that a person may perceive it offensively, but then because active curiosity is a testament, it carries us far, and then that can be something to cur be curious about. I'm sorry that that hurts your feelings, I genuinely want to understand. And I genuinely don't want to understand why it hurts your feelings. I think that curiosity is so important, it goes really back to uh, our history of ideas, at least in the West. And the Enlightenment is really what broke the uh, hold of the, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages in, in Europe. Uh, people like Copernicus and Galileo and, and Leonardo da Vinci, they were curious and they explored the world around them. Before that, in the Dark Ages, no one questioned anything. There was an authority that largely came from the church, that the earth was the center of the universe, etc., etc. And it was when the Enlightenment came in that broke that and made us find out other things about the universe, other truths. And it only could have happened because of curiosity. Now, in the East, and you know that I like to bring in Buddhist uh, thinking or, or perceptions, 
uh, John Cabot Zinn uh, speaks of non-judgmental awareness on purpose. That's his definition of mindfulness, by the way. Non-judgmental awareness on purpose. Now that really ties in with the Testament of Neutrality, Testament number one, the first Testament of Action, and goes a little bit further talking about awareness. But this second Testament, the Testament of Active Curiosity, is where I think psychoanalysis actually adds something unique of its own, curiosity. In Buddhism, we observe and we don't judge, but in psychoanalysis, we don't judge and we're curious. We want to know more. Now, from a mindfulness point of view or other points of view, this might be considered mm, engaging with something, you know, engaging, uh, being attached to it. But it's not attachment that causes suffering. It's using the mind, the our human basic feeling of wanting to understand something uh, that is active curiosity. So I want to give you another example where the testament of active curiosity was essential for getting out of a stuck problem that a parent had with her adult son. Now, this young man who I was seeing as my patient had gotten into trouble in college. He was not going to school and he was hosting big, big parties, which he actually was pretty good at, but it was a big problem. And he even had gotten into some legal trouble as a result. And he had to drop out of school, leave the town that the school was in and come back and live at home. And this Young man was a was a smart kid. I, I call everybody kid. He was a smart kid, and he was a good kid, but he's what you would call maybe a bad boy. And so living at home, there was a lot of tension. And the mother in particular was really at wit's end about how they were going to live together. And she decided she was going to be very strict, and she had a list of chores that he needed to accomplish, there was a curfew in which he had to be home. Uh, she was very concerned about any drugs and alcohol. And she even tried to make a contract about how he should speak to her and his father. And of course, he did not react very well to this. He became angry and oppositional, refused to do things and would actually speak very rudely to her. And it created enormous tension and a and a lot of uh, high expressed emotion, which is another concept that we'll talk about in a later episode. So she even went to see her own therapist about this, which was a very good thing to do. She was able to kind of talk some things out and understand herself better. And the therapist said, he's punishing you. And the mother thought that made a lot of sense. And quite frankly, I, I thought it made sense too. I thought he was punishing her as well. And this uh, interpretation allowed the mother to feel reassured. But she said it wasn't very useful. She still didn't know, what should I do? What, what am I going to do about this? I'm really stuck. Should there be these consequences? They seem to just be making things worse. But on the other hand, I don't want to let up on them because uh, he, he'll get out of control. So that's where we brought in curiosity. So he's punishing you. Okay, but why is he punishing you? And her answer was, well, he's belligerent. Okay, well, why is he belligerent? Well, he's just self-destructive. He's going to make everything go downhill. Uh, okay, well, why is he self-destructive? And let me just say as an aside, that uh word, or th that way of speaking about people as self-destructive is a pet peeve of mine. I don't believe in self-destructive. I think, yes, people do things that are very harmful to themselves. Obviously, they get into patterns that destroy themselves. But the intention is not primarily or fundamentally to destroy oneself. There's always a more fundamental intention that the self-destructive behavior is trying to accomplish. And 
I'm getting a little bit into testament number three, the testament of birthright of goodness. But I just want to say right here that self-destructive, if you use that or hear that word, stop and say, what is this really about? Which is what we were doing. And ultimately when we said, well, okay, why is he being belligerent? Why is he being self-destructive? She finally was able to say, well, I think that he's anxious. And that was really helpful. Then she could kind of get into understanding what was going on in his mind, not seeing him as just a problem, but seeing him as somebody who had motivation and something going on with them. And then we could be curious about herself. Why am I being such a hard ass? Why do I feel like I need to have these consequences and these contracts and she you know even wanted him to sign them which she refused to do it just created an enormous amount of tension and she could see that but she didn't know how to get out of that she didn't want to just let him off the hook and she felt like she was being this really mean person and no one liked her the father thought she was being a little hard too and she was not feeling good about herself and so we said well why are you doing that and she said, I want to support his recovery. And even being able to say that, she was able to get back to her own motivation. Again, jumping ahead to testament number three, the testament of birthright. She realized that she had a good intention. I want him to get better. I want my son to get better. And that, just recognizing that, allowed her to feel good about herself. She even thanked me for kind of pursuing this line of questioning with her. And... In addition to feeling like she had been recognized as a good mother and she believed that her son was trying to do his best, she was also with her son able to get out of this stuck space and talk with him and they were able to come to an understanding, they were able to re-solidify their relationship and that was the foundation for moving on and doing something better. So we see here that the testament of active curiosity, the second testament of the psychonaut, is a testament because it is so fundamental and we need it always when we are exploring our inner worlds and also when we're relating to each other. And the examples that I gave, one from business, one from, from parenting, are examples that showed how being curious allowed people to get out of a stuck situation. These were examples of individual conversations between individuals. But I also believe that these testaments help us on a larger social level as well. And the testament of active curiosity, I think, is so important to remember right now. And we're in danger of losing it. As I mentioned um, back in the episode on optimal frustration, I attended a panel on race and psychoanalysis. And one of the panelists said the biggest problem that comes out of the extremity in which our society is engaging on these social issues is that it prevents us from being curious. It kills our curiosity. And I think this is true in discussions of, of race, of many other situations as well. For example, another big issue that's going on right now, of course, is sexual harassment and sexual assault, the, the, the whole Harvey Weinstein the situation, and, and many other things are coming up as well. But again, this is so intense that we're starting to lose our curiosity. What is going on here? Why is this happening? By asking why, it sometimes feels, and I have heard, that it's somehow letting the perpetrator off the hook. That is not the point of curiosity. The point of curiosity and the whole point of the psychonaut show and psychonautics, whatever we're going to call it, is to understand so we can solve problems, not so that we can excuse behavior. And the issue of political correctness is very relevant here and there are people who say political correctness is terrible and then there are people who are very insistent about political correctness and i've thought about this and i want to say this that when we speak carefully about each other and and groups that we don't belong to 
When we speak carefully to be respectful, that is always a good thing. But when we use political correctness to criticize other people, to feel superior to them, that's not a good thing. That is not in the best interest of anyone. I came across a really nice quote that I want to share with you from Mario Livio, who published recently a book called Why? What Makes Us Curious? He's actually an astrophysicist, but became uh, interested in uh, psych- this aspect of psychology. And in his book, he writes, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. Now, I really feel like I have the best job that I could possibly have. Because why is a question that I get to ask all the time. And that's actually my job. And why is basically the question, the word that is shorthand for the testament of active curiosity. When I was a child, I used to drive my mother crazy, asking, why is the sky blue? Why can't we make wheat out of the grass in the backyard? Why can't I dig a hole to China? Why didn't you take my sister to the Annie audition? She could have been a star. And on and on and on. And I know that parents out there know exactly what I'm talking about. I recently learned of a word in Russian that we don't have an equivalent for in English. The word is pachemuchka. And this comes from the Russian word for why, which is pachemuchka. And a pachemuchka is a child who's always asking why. And I think it's so great that Russian actually has a word for this. Maybe I should change the name of this podcast to the pachemuchka show. So what is the lesson here? I hope you can see that the testament of active curiosity, the second testament of the psychonaut, is a testament because it's so fundamental and basic and important. We need it, along with the testament of neutrality, to better understand each other, to better understand ourselves. But the thing about curiosity is that it is healing. It makes us feel that someone's interested in our story. I'll tell you about an example where I was seeing a young woman who really needed therapy, but she didn't want it. And rather than kind of berating her about why she had to come and what she needed to do and how her life was all messed up, which is what her parents did, I simply was curious about her. Okay, you don't want to come, why not? And this in itself didn't even matter what the reason was. I mean, it mattered what the reason was, but just having somebody say, okay, what's going on? Let me be curious. That in itself was helpful and engaging and allowed her to begin to take steps to help herself. Testament number two is about what's underneath, never being satisfied with the answer. That doesn't mean that we don't feel happy or satisfied when we come to a conclusion, when we learn something from asking why. We do feel happy And we learn something from it. It helps our story, our understanding go along. But active curiosity is really saying, that's great. Now I want to know more and more and more. Ta-Nehisi Coates in his book, Between the World and Me, writes that curiosity actually saved him. It wasn't the streets and his affiliation there that saved him and not when he went to school though he loved his school experience, that didn't save him. And religion, which was important in his his community, did not save him. He said it was curiosity. And he wrote, it is a constant questioning, questioning as ritual, questioning as exploration, rather than the search for certainty. And really the point about curiosity is it's not that we're trying to get to the answer and be done, but it's the importance of the questioning in and of itself. So there we have the first two fundamental principles that are going to be the foundation of our exploration, our searching, our turning things over, and our traveling around in our inner worlds. Testament number one, the testament of neutrality, and testament number two, the testament of active curiosity. 
this is how we work. And that's why I call them the Testaments of Action. So this episode has been the season finale of season one of The Psychonaut Show. And I want to thank you all for being on this journey with me. And I hope that you will tell others about it and point out maybe particular episodes that might be of use to them and their situations. We began the Psychonaut show on the Celtic holiday of Beltana, which is the beginning of spring, the beginning of growth, and we're ending on the Celtic holiday of Samhain, the final harvest. And for the winter, we're going to be taking a break from recording and working on season two. In season two, we'll get to the Testaments of Faith, Testaments number three and four, the Testament of Birthright, and the Testament of Reason. We're also going to be putting together some interviews, so it won't just be me talking, but we'll have other people on, some famous psychoanalysts, some entertainers, and particularly some comics, I hope, maybe some parents as well, and even some people in business. There's going to be more amazing and useful ideas from the gigantic vault of psychoanalytic theory. And I hope that some of you will write in or call in or find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and share your conundrums. And hopefully we will have some episodes on that as well. In the interim, in addition to working on season two, we're going to get more involved online and hopefully have more interaction with all of you on some of the topics that came up this past season. So connect with us on social media. Look for some reflection points that I'll be sending out from time to time. Hope to increase the conversation there. And look for season two coming up in the spring. This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better, if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything. And remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. All the patient stories presented on The Psychonaut Show are created by me to illustrate an idea. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O.